<laughs> but I probably will. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> no, it's fine. So. <sighs> Helen. Thank you very much. For your time, I appreciate it. It's totally, <laughs> you look, you look, you know, it's fine. Talking exactly like we were two minutes ago. Oh, I hear um, Lucky to live close. It is lucky to live close. So we're going to go straight into it. I know, I know a relatively small amount about you. Okay, I know the significant things. So, London Met, uh, SO19. That's yeah. Yeah. Am I correct in saying you were the? Am I correct in saying that you were the first female member of SO19? Not quite. Go for you. it. Then. Go for it. I was um, about the third female uh, on the ARVs, the armed arm response vehicles, um, but I was the first mum. So at the time, um, I'd got Ben, who was about three, and I was a single parent as well. So I was the first mum, but not the first woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were two before. Mm -hmm. um, Unless, yeah. So for people listening who don't like don't understand what SO19 is and what the R response vehicles are. Can you explain that for me? Yeah, sure. Or for them? SO19 at the time um, was the firearms department, the specialist firearms department of the Met. And the ARVs, which it was a fairly new concept, um, were the armed response vehicles. So um, uh, at that time, the role was that... Um, we went out in vehicles and patrolled and responded to incidents that just you were were evolving. Whereas, and there was another part to SO19, which was more the pre-planned operations, which was a different part of SO19. So we were in the cars, out responding to things that were just you know happening on a daily basis. What you were talking? So I I joined the ARVs in 1994. Okay, when did you get when did you get into the Met? I, I joined the cadets in 1984 when I was um, 18 and did a year in the cadets, <clears throat> which was all sort of um, adventure training, um, community service within London at different places and um, sort of discipline, marching, fitness, that kind of thing. That was a fantastic year and then went to Hendon um, in 1985. Where's Hendon? So that's... Sorry. The, Hendon is... Uh, was the big training centre where everybody got trained. So the cadets were there, the driving school was there, and uh, all the training everyone for, in the for Met recruits. Got you went there. So yeah. everyone in the Met got trained there? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so it was not just like not just initial training. It was what were you saying about the driving school? Um, they had like continuation training, you go back for different courses? Yeah, there was a driving school there. I think the there was CID training and different things, yeah. So, and there was a big... Um, I think it's all gone now, but um, there was, you know, like a running track and a you know, great big complex, yeah. Oh, um, when when you, so when, when you commission, not commission, do you commission into the Met? Is that what it's called? No, um, that's, you swear an oath to the Queen, affirmation I think it is, yeah. So kind yeah, of maybe. similar kind of thing. When did you get into the Met? So I went into the Met as a cadet in 1984 and then did my year as a cadet and then went to training school and did the recruit training um, and then went out to um, Hornsey Division, North London. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the beginning of, of 1986, went to Hornsey. Hornsey wasn't, oh, North London wasn't wasn't the uh, nicest of places back then. I know it's not, I know it's not now. <laughs> <laughs> well, cer certain areas, not the whole, yeah. so, not the whole North London. Yeah, area. ironically, it was, it was just after the um, Tottenham riots, which was sort of, you know, bordering the division that I went to. And um, Keith Blakelock, PC, had been killed during the riots there. So, yeah, it was, um, I worked with a lot of people that were, were with him you know, and involved in that incident, you know. So I went went out as a new probationer and all the, you know, it was a, quite a, a difficult time for a lot of people. They'd seen some horrific things, really. Mm. Um, so it was a bit of a baptism of fire, you know. I'd come from a little little village in the Cotswolds and, uh, yeah, you soon, uh, it was a you know, steep learning curve. Mm. It really yeah. was. How, what was it like um, in that environment where you got a lot of experienced people uh, what's it was like being accept like getting an acceptance into the unit, into the Met? Yeah, I think really, um, it as as long as you worked hard and tried hard and 
you know, did your bit, you were accepted. And I think it was actually quite a, a good time for, for women joining the police as well. Things were really changing. There was a lot of opportunities that, you know, there hadn't been just a few years before. So, yeah, you know, as long as you, you worked hard and were prepared to listen and learn and, you know, you, you, you got accepted. I think it's the same across anything. The reason I asked is it, <clears throat> it sort of struck a similar chord with me with the military. You, when you there's a there's a different there's a difference between joining up and going into a going into a unit when people have got you know sort of average experience because nothing much has been going on mm. as opposed to joining up into a unit. Let's say join up in two thousand and six or two thousand and four even when people have been going to Iraq. You go into a unit that's just come back from a tour of Iraq. It's very different going to a unit that people have sort of that. From a military sense, battle hardened and experienced some some uh, some intense things. It's, it's, that acceptance can be difficult to be gained. But again, it's a similar thing. Work hard. Yeah. Do what you're supposed to do. Keep your mouth shut. We're supposed to keep your mouth shut and be good at your job. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. um, I remember <laughs> I remember being told because you went out with um, like a, a what was good. It was sort of a more experienced police officer would you know come out with you in the beginning and you, um I, I, I remember the first person that came up to me t and I was like terrified thinking god what's he you know what's he going to ask me stood there as a little 19 year old um and uh, it was just sort of that he just wanted directions you know but I remember that and uh I, I got told you you need you you're too nice you know so um you just you just had to it was a really really steep learning curve and like you say keeping you you know keeping quiet and just listening and taking on board and and just learning and 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 you, you get all the you get given all the 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 jobs that um you know the more mundane difficult jobs that other people sort of don't want to do anymore you know it, um like the sudden deaths and things like that you know you get sent to all of those but that's all part of learning and you've got to do those things you know mm. so I, I remember the first one of the first things i went to was a hanging and uh oh no yeah this guy had hung himself in his home and you know i can like picture it now and and we, we had to s s he was left hanging from the stairs and we had, we had to sit in the, like his, his front room it was surreal waiting for the coroner's officer and everything to come which like seemed like hours and uh yeah and it, it just things like that never leave you you know it, it, at, at the time you sort of deal with it and but um i can picture it now it's funny isn't it how everything sort of stays in your head yeah you you the so I suppose through throughout your career, you saw that wasn't the first dead. That was the only wasn't the only dead body you saw. It's it's um it's obvious, but also interesting that it'd be the first one that sticks in your mind. But <clears throat> again, with it, and it, one of the interesting things about memory that is always um, stuck in my head is is that you don't you, your brain never remembers the negative. Very rarely remembers the negative or the pain aspects of something. You know, so you just remember the dead, the dead, the dead body in the room, which I mean. Sitting in the front room with the with the dead body in the in the landing, must have been, landing or hallway. It was it was. Sort I don't know why I asked yeah, that. I don't was, know why. <laughs> it was in the, it was in the landing um, downstairs in the hallway. So as you came in the front door, there was the poor guy, and it was really funny. Well, not funny at all, but I remember sitting there with with this more senior PC and this poor guy he'd got like a, some mucus coming out of his nose and it started there and we were there it must have been there quite a while because we it it just went car like dropped down and down Doctrine. yeah down to his knee in the end and I, that I just remember it's funny the things that you remember mm. yeah um 19 and the thing is then as well I'm assuming that there was no uh like if that happened today Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm guessing you still got friends in the force. Is that if that happened today? You'd be you'd, you'd finish the job, get back in, right? There's counselling available if you want it. You need to go and speak to the psychiatrist. Is that what that, that must be? What happens now? It, there's nothing like that back then, was there? I mean, that was that I talk about it because it's just one of the first things I, I went to. But it, that was just an ordinary mm. occurrence, and I say ordinary because it clearly isn't. But you know, it was just it. <laughs> that that's the kind of thing you know that you you dealt with and you're absolutely right there was back then um 
you know, you, you talk, there wasn't, a, the word stress really back then was a taboo subject. Um, it wasn't something that was discussed at all, you know, and I don't think anybody was really aware of it either. Um, you know, you look at a lot of the, now in hindsight, looking back, you know, you look at a lot of the, the, probably the coping mechanisms that weren't particularly healthy, you know, like a lot of alcohol drinking and that people did, you know, and to, to cope and the black humour as well, which I'm sure is, is common throughout all the, the emergency services and, and, and you guys, you know, the, the, um, so yeah, there was nothing like that. And you literally just went, went on to the next job once you'd done your paperwork and whatever that was, you know, whatever that threw up and, you know, just there was no concept of stress. Interesting that black humour. I'd, I'd never considered black humour as being a coping me mechanism until you mentioned it there. I suppose that's what it is, isn't it? Yeah. Is it? Is that what it is? I think it is because, um, you know, I take that take that incident with the guy who hung himself. Um, I think we laughed about about the situation, you know, sitting in his front room and afterwards, because I think not that it's funny at all, and you know, you have. Uh, a lot of empathy for the guy and you know his family so it's not that it's a funny situation but I do think that if you don't have some kind of release um that and, and almost probably turn it into something a bit more ordinary if that As makes sense like normalizing it yeah like yeah if you can joke yeah. about it it's normal yeah interesting yeah that is interesting we you're absolutely right about across across all the services it's, it's common across all the services that that black dark humor that if you say it around a different circle, you know, the, the kind of humour that you couldn't get away with at a dinner table, unless the whole dinner table was all ex-military. Absolutely, or ex totally inappropriate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's yes. so true, isn't it? Yeah, and and that, that's what that was what happened, you know, and and um, so there was no no debriefing or anything of about, about, about anything. And I mean, if I go go on to um, like the my first um, big trauma, I call it, um, that was in 1991. And uh, it was just a, a, an ordinary Monday afternoon, hot hot September's day, and we got a call to this guy causing a disturbance in Wood Green High Road, which was a shopping, big shopping area. So um, it was fairly, it was fairly quiet. So two, <coughs> two units went along and I was driving the van. Um, and with a colleague of mine in the passenger seat and we, we pulled up and spotted spotted this guy and it was obvious by the description who he was and he crossed the road so I jumped out of the van and crossed the road. What was the, sorry, what was the situation? What was the... It was just some of the shops um, had called us because he'd been going up and down the high road preaching and causing a bit of a disturbance. So... Um, and preaching we, yeah preaching about god i think and things like that so i think he was just being a bit of a, a nuisance in the shop so we'd got called to, to come and speak to him and um it turned out he was a mental patient he was caring the community a mental health patient and it, it, he stopped taking his tablets but we didn't know that at the time so um i i jumped out of the van went across the road to where i could see him and my colleague, he went in the shop to find out more about what was going on. And, and a panda car drew up behind us with two um, two other colleagues in. And he got his back to me when I got got across the road. He stood stood on the path. And um, I just, as I walked up to him, I just said something like, you know, hi, mate, what you've been doing? And literally swung around. And the next thing I knew, I was flying through the air backwards. Um, and I, th it, it's happened so quickly, you know, I it sort of instantly thought, oh, you know, I've been punched, um, got back up off the floor, but thought, God, that hurts. But it, this was all like really, really fast. Um, and it, at the corner of my eye, I could see like him going for my, uh, she's now my you know, really good friend, my colleague, he was going for her and I was really angry. So I, I went back towards him to try and arrest him, try and stop him. And again, then I went flying backwards um, onto the pavement. He hit you again. And he got me again. But what I didn't know and I didn't see was in his fist, he was punching with a knife in between 
so sticking out of his Jesus fist. Christ. And he was a big guy. So, and I mean, I was pretty fit and strong, did a lot of weight training and stuff. Um, yeah. And the second time I was on the pavement, because um, we didn't have body armor or anything like that, um, I, I just, my shirt literally turned red. I, I just remember this, like, but it was really bizarre because I hadn't seen a knife. I thought, he's punched me so hard, I'm bleeding, but it was just, I was just yeah. really confused. And, you know, it's, again, it's this is happening so quickly, faster than I can talk, really. Um, and so I tried to get on the radio and call for assistance and um, remember sort of chaos around me, me, but no sort of detail of it, you know, um, and my f f colleague sort of behind me. Um, yeah, and basically what it, what he'd done, he, he stabbed four, the, all four of us ten times. Jesus. Yeah. Where did he, where did he get you? So he, the first punch, stab, stab was in the stomach. So that was the first one that set, sent me flying, um, which I got up from. And then the second, I had two more and it, up here and in my forearm. Um, How big was the blade? Well, thank goodness, it... it it was um, a Swiss Army knife. So yeah, was, but they're still like four inches, aren't they? But thank goodness, I mean, it could if it had been any longer, yeah. I think we probably would have all been killed. Or have been put in a different place yeah. in the body would have would have caused. I mean, what was the damage? Yeah. What was? Well, I'm, I mean, I'm so lucky. It, the um, the stomach wound, which was the most serious, really, um, just <coughs> just missed. You know my, my internal organs by millimeters, so I, I was like, re I was really lucky. Um, the one in my shoulder was quite deep, and I remember looking at it in A and E and like sort of seeing it, the bone and stuff, and didn't really look again, you know. But yeah, the stomach one was the worst one. But yeah, we were all so lucky that day. All the colleagues survived. Yeah, all survived. Yeah. What happened to the the, uh, the um, criminal? Yeah, well, he got. Was he a criminal? Is he a criminal? Because well, he was mentally not, ill. See, he's a victim, isn't he, of of the system going wrong, isn't he? Really, um, mm. and ironically, suffering from mental health issues, <clears throat> which we know a lot more about now. I know a lot more about from what has happened to me. Uh, I think he was sent to somewhere like Rampton indefinitely, so which is a sort of a top security sort of men's mental house or prison but what's happened to him i don't know since it's an interesting uh it's, when you when you look at um when you look at the, the that line between okay it are they, are they a criminal because they've done they've done something like that or are they or are they not a criminal because they're mentally ill and it's not and it's in inverted commas it's not their fault when you sort of when you take a deep dive into that that consideration that discussion it's almost when you look at it in reality Everyone, there's a spectrum of, of, of mental health, right? We assign labels to everything these days. Yeah. And there are, but in general, there's a spectrum of mental health. And you've got zero, which is 100% healthy, again, the inverted commas, whatever mm. that is, which no one, I would argue, no one is. And at the other end, you've got sort of 100% mental, be that, you know, complete schizophrenia, de detachment from the world to stress levels so high that. You cannot function normally, you know, mm. like you can't get out of bed, you know, you can't make rational decisions. We were all somewhere on that spectrum. Yeah. You know, there, there's an argument you made that if, you know, if I was to walk out of here now and because of, you know, high stress levels, someone said the wrong thing to me and I fly out the handle and completely out of character mm. and I fill that person in, yeah, then there's an argument you made that I was mentally unstable at that time and I was mentally ill. Yeah. So what? And again, what's it, I'm just it's it's a really interesting it's a really interesting topic. Who is who is completely right in the mind when they do something so wrong, you know, so uh, wrong? Absolutely. It's. I mean, and thank thankfully, there's so much more awareness now than there was back then, you know. But yeah, I, I mean, he was a victim really because he wasn't taking his medication and his <clears throat> his two like great his phobias which were real in his head were women and three women police officers turned up and his, his second <laughs> phobia, hatred, whatever you call it, paranoia, was police officers and four of us turned up. So the poor guy, you know, it was his, wor his worst case scenario, so it wasn't his fault. 
that's the majority of men in the UK, I'd argue. <laughs> There's two biggest phobias, women and police officers. Well, yeah, I think that's a topic of conversation for another day, that one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah so poor heck. guy. You know, it's it's like his worst, you know, his worst day ever. What? Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, what was uh, the aftermath? What happened after with you guys? Yeah. So oh, what with you, what what was the what happened? Well, yeah. I mean, there we were on the floor, and it was, some of the crowd were hostile. Um, say it, shouting. You know, they got what they deserved. And what? Yeah, yeah. What crowd? Yeah, in because it was a big in, big shopping centre, so oh it was my busy. God. I've not been to that shopping centre. It's still in existence now, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, right. it is. Um, so I, this, yeah, this mental preacher, no, sorry, I interrupted yeah, interrupt no. you. This mental preacher, I, I mean that in the politest possible sense, stabs four officers yeah. ten times and the crowd were hostile towards you guys. Some of them. Some of them were amazing. I mean, I was helped by a passerby and, and uh, f- funnily enough... It, it, she, what she said made me realise I'd been stabbed because she was pressing on my stomach and she she said to somebody else, oh, she's been stabbed stabbed in the stomach as well. And I was like lying there. Um, and that was before any of, you know, my colleagues arrived to help out. But what on earth could the sentiment have been at Wood Green if that was the attitude? Uh, hang on. So back, hang on. I'm just thinking. Back then, there was a lot, it was a, there was a heavily um, black, neighbourhood, am I correct in saying we're green? And there was, there was a lot of friction between that uh, demographic of society in that area towards police, or the authorities. That's Am I right in saying that? Yeah, a l- large, okay. largely that's true. I think from what had happened, you know, a few years before. and oh, the riots, yeah. Yeah, the riots, yeah. and so, yeah. I'm um, too young to remember, sorry. Yeah, but I, I think a lot of the crowd were very helpful. You know, I think it was a small group, and I wasn't all that aware of what was I going on around me. You latched onto what you heard. Yeah, 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 yeah I was yeah. kind of um, trying to, thinking, God, you know, I hope I'm not going to die, staying awake. And then some colleagues came. And I, always, I remember that feeling um, of uh, the first guy, friendly face that I knew, for, you know, from the station. And, you know, I think he'd run about half a mile to get there. Um, and that was awesome. And he the words of reassurance were just that was amazing yeah so um we all went off to to different hospitals because um um and we were all diff- you know treated for our injuries and I, um jenny and i ended up in the north middle middle sex hospital together um and was, oh. sorry yeah and again i remember going into like the a and E sort of crash area on on the trolley, getting you through in in the ambulance, and the, the black humour again that we spoke about earlier. You know, some there I was with pretty much nothing on, lay there, and one of my f- friends walks in and says, "Great abs, Helen." You know, that's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's just like, yeah, <laughs> which is, I guess, how people cope. You know, it was just they're so upset, and you know. It was, <laughs> traumatic for for everybody really Mm. um yeah so we had a a few days in hospital and it was a bit of a a media circus you know which again i think lessons have been learned from you know that there's a lot of we were on you know all the the pet tele the newspapers television we wanted to be interviewed by the radio and it kind of overtook everything really you know we we were sort of we were I think it was kind of I don't mean to sound harsh but I think it was kind of good press for the, the Met in a way you know for officers it made all the headlines uh, and I do think lessons have been learned I think we've come a long way since then um, and sort of family almost came second to all that that was going uh, on I see, uh, yeah, if that makes yeah, sense yeah, yeah. but again it's a learning curve and I'm not being critical because I think lessons have been learnt from that, really. Mm. Um, and we, it was amazing. We had so many cards and things. It was incredible, even from prisoners and things. Really? Yeah, after. Not get, ones well, that you put away? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. People were were amazing. You That's know, good, yeah. yeah, it was really good. A um, couple of days in hospital and then went back to being, being a mum. 
Oh yeah, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. So you were still in the Met, just bog standard. I don't mean so bog standard. I mean yeah. you weren't in S ninety at this point. So that was just as a you know PC on on the streets. Yeah, relief. Yeah. I mean, how long between? Um... Oh, in fact, going back <clears throat> when you were, when you were back um, on the beat, so to speak, you have to. If I'm using terms here, like that slang police terms that I heard on the bill, and yeah. they're completely wrong, you feel free to collect me. Like on the beat, <laughs> do you actually say that? Did you? Yeah, actually, yeah. Just mention, you just mentioned the bill. The cast of the bill sent us all these signed photographs. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Uh, um, when you went back on, on, on uh, back to work, back on the beat, what did, had anything changed in your mind? What was it like um, going back out and dealing with job the job or was it just straight back into it? Box, you know, routine. Yeah, I had a while off because obviously I needed to physically recover from injuries. I had a few problems with the one one wound not healing particularly well, and so I had a period of time off. Um, again, you know, stress wasn't you know anything that anybody thought of, you know. So after I, I forget now how long I had off, but I think I had a f- few weeks off and went back, um, but went back sort of what they call sort of restricted duties so it was a few hours a day and I was really lucky I worked with some really good people who kind of when you look back were sort of for before their time in a way how they thought about mental health and well not not that it was discussed but they realized that you know needed to go back to the scene so I went down with a good friend of mine and we just walked down to the scene of where it had happened, you know, that was quite a big, important thing. But, you know, just putting on the uniform hmm. um, felt uneasy, but I kind of probably didn't know what was going on. You know, obviously now I was... You trauma- mean mentally? Yeah, mentally I was traumatised by, by it all. Um, but it wasn't something that we, you know, anybody talked about back then. But, it's, yeah, so going back to the scene was really good, really therapeutic and just... And I felt after a few, you know, a, a few, I think I had a few weeks of restricted duties, I was back onto normal shift work and just life sort of went on. Until the next time. Until the next time. Yeah, which what was... What year was it? What year did the stabbing happen? So the stabbing was 1991 and then the next sort of, <laughs> what, I, what I call major significant factor in my life was um, caught up in a terrorist bomb blasts that were green so I was in I was actually studying for my sergeant's exam at the time and on an early turn I was really lucky that 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 um if it was quiet I got about an hour or so in an office to do some studying and I'd got my radio with me and I heard this you know this call come out from the control room that there'd been a coded bomb threat to Wood Green from the the RA so that's 1993. Okay yeah Yeah. so because it was coded you knew there were going to be bombs going off. So everybody dived out, got in whatever vehicle they could um, and went down again to exactly the same place where the stabbing had, had happened um, in 91. Oh, the same shopping centre? Yeah, down to Green Shopping Centre, exactly the same place. So the, ac- so, so, so the actions on for you guys at that time was just, right, everyone get out, we need to get people out of the shopping centre, get straight down there and just start getting, it. clearing everybody people Everybody came out from the canteens everywhere, you know, um, yeah, exactly that here, yeah, just to start getting people out of the shopping centre. We didn't know where, cause it's a huge complex. So when you turned so, up, people were oblivious. Did, doing no their shopping, knew? it was, I don't, forget what day of the week it was, but no, nobody had a clue. And f- funnily enough, when you start running into shops and start telling people they've got to get out, they kind of look at you a bit oddly and, you know, don't really kind of get it. So what you ended. What were you saying? <laughs> so, well, just saying, you know, we've had a coded bomb that there's going to be a bomb go. If we don't know where it is, you need to get out. But it kind of became more and more urgent because people, I don't think, kind of grasped the severity of of the situation. Yeah. You're in the middle of shopping, Helen. You're <laughs> that, in the middle well, of shopping. Exactly. There's all these. <laughs> yeah. But I'm, I'm at the front of the checkout. I've been waiting for half an hour. <laughs> Crazy, isn't it? I, yeah. I try and think what I mean. I try and work out what my head would be like if someone came in and said that to me. I think I'd be I'd be bugging out straight away. But that's just off past experience. Yeah. If you're an average Joe blogs, it would be a. Is this real? Am I being filmed? 
You know, where's the camera? <laughs> yeah. where's, the, where's, the, where's the smartphone still on me? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, so that's what we all started doing just randomly, really. There was no, you know. Um, and uh, I, I, mean, I remember it. I went in through these sort of glass doorways off the just just off the street where there was escalators and I was just shouting you know you need to get out and um there was just this almighty boom um and again it that happens really quickly and it was really bizarre and I guess a lot of people can probably relate to this who have been in a situation you know of sort of a bomb going off or whatever that it 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 just went really quiet and there was smoke. I could see, see all these pigeons flying up. It was really weird. And I was, I'd just gone up, I ended up on the floor again, but got up and I wasn't injured. Um, and, and then I found out later that the bomb was relatively small, but in a, in a bin just out on the street where I'd just come in from. Um, and you mentioned that before about the birds. Yeah. Oh, it was quiet. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess a lot of people, who, you know, can relate to that. It was really bizarre. Anyway, it, and the alarms were all going off from the shops. And I remember this guy in a suit, he ran in. Um, and I screamed at him, yeah, come back out. I ran after him and he went up the escalator. He was just determined to go that way. So I, I came out back onto the street and I saw a colleague of mine. And I think I... I I think I did say something like at this time, this effing job, because it was just, it was so scary. It Because it, you didn't just didn't know where, if there was another one where it was going to go off or... So we were just telling people to get out, screaming at them. And literally, we, me and my colleague, we moved up the road a little bit up the footpath and another bomb went off in the bin where we'd literally just been stood by. Fucking hell. We were just so lucky. So, oh, no. yeah, it was just complete chaos in my head and the scene as well. And um, they put another um, sort of dummy bomb bomb threat in where the cordon was and on the road, you know, up. So it was it was a, just a nightmare. Chaos. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so that I, that went on for I don't know how however long. I sort of lost sort of track of, of time and everything. And then eventually the ones who were there initially um, were taken away um, up to, we went up to Wood Green. What, what do you mean the ones that were taken? The, ones well, that were the, the officers who were sort of there initially dealing with getting people evacuated and have been in, in the sort of bomb, you know, the impact of the bombs and that were taken off. And I don't think any, some people were hit by a bit of flying glass, but there were no major, major in, injuries. And um, funny enough, that's the first time we did a bit of debriefing. That was only because a good friend of mine who'd been at the at the on duty at the stabbing kind of realised that from the stabbing that we kind of needed to get together and talk a bit, which we did in a little office straight after. So what kind of form did that take? It was again completely sort of random. We all. Everybody just sat sat in this office and just kind of said what where they'd been and what had happened to them, but there was no. It was just literally because of this one guy. He kind of realised um, that we needed to do that, but there was no you know procedure or anything at the back in the day. Yeah, there's just, just I mean, there's two there's two there's two benefits to that, isn't it? We we call it an after action review in military. It probably called that in other other. I say the military when I was serving with three power, call it an after after action review, and we do it. <clears throat> it the bigger the operation, then the more formal that would become. You know, if it was a small operation, it would be if it was just me and the team, and we'd have a little debrief. But if it was like a battle group up, then all the commanders would go in and have an after action review, and it'd be like what, what you said there. You talk through stage by stage, phase by phase, what happened. And it's as much for it's as beneficial for a lessons learned perspective moving forward, and mm. maybe change of tactics or or briefings or whatever for other people in other units as much as it is a cathartic therapeutic benefit in talking through those things and understanding what went on with the different units as much for yourself or for members of your team or, or other members of other teams to understand what went on mm. you know that's not suggesting that there is an issue or there could be an issue or there should be an issue but 
it definitely definitely benefit those things. That's why I asked what kind of form it took, and it's interesting that you talk through the you know you talk through the stages of what happened and where. And that's yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's the best way to do it because it's it, I think not that I'm a flipping psychiatrist, but it's it, it's a formal way that that on the face of it is a is a it, it's a, 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 a professional completely professional revisit to an incident mm. but with a with a tip of the hat to you know the the mental side of things yeah and again it was in in an era where really what well, we didn't nobody was talking about mental health you know it wasn't um it's just this one guy kind of got it that we needed to some for some reason you know get together and make sure everybody was safe and for everybody to see that everybody was safe who'd been down there as well, that we were okay, you know. Um, and sort of, I, it's great really because we've come so far and I think actually things were learned from our incidents that did change things. I know that um, John Davison, who who was stabbed, I'll go back to the stabbing, he, he did um, a lot of work, uh, research on a body armour, because we didn't have body armour then, battens, because we only had little tiny wooden truncheons, how you approach suspects, and I helped him a bit, and um, the officer safety manual was written for the Met, and it brought in battens, body armour, and a different way of, directly as a result of our incident. Oh, amazing. So I was really proud mm. that I had a bit of an input in that, and our incident actually, you know, changed policing, really. And also, so... The bombing um, impacted on people, and the guy who I was talking about, he went on to, later on being in the firearms department, and he was a senior officer, and he was able to bring in a lot of change around, you know, post shooting procedures and mental health. So, it kind of a lot of good came out. And that's of, Richard. Uh, no, that that was actually somebody called Barry. Who, oh, sorry. Yeah, and. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I look back and think, actually, you know, we we learn lessons, don't we, you know, as, when things happen. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of good did come out of, of, of what happened to us. Well, there's always positives to be drawn from the negatives, isn't there? Yeah, definitely. Um, so you, so you, you got you get stabbed three times, right? Then you got, you got blown up by the IRA, this fucking job, as you said, this fucking job. <laughs> And yet, then after those two, you you, you still decided to do for a bit of um, SO19. Well, yeah, it was really bizarre after. <laughs> yeah, after. Not one yeah. fuck was given. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Part of the language. After the bombing, I I just went went home. I think we we had a couple of days off. Um, went to see my mum and dad in in Charlottecum. Carried on studying for the sergeant's exam. And past that, um, it was like, yeah. And then, as you rightly say, Hugh, I thought it was a really good idea to try for the firearms department. So that was in 1994. What was the, what was the appeal? What did you What did you fancy with it? I don't know. I think, again, in hindsight, I, I wonder whether there was something going on in me, and I wasn't aware of this at all, that maybe I was a bit kind of safer there you know in a bizarre way but i don't know that wasn't a conscious thought it's just something i've mulled over over Possibly. the years Possibly. but i don't know but yeah I, it was just a, a challenge really that not you know it was something that had only just been open to women uh for a few years and um it was just kind of another challenge really that i kind of went for that that and, that can play into it as well it's it's uh occupying the mind with something and keeping it occupied keeping it forward science exam s19 i'm not saying that's the case you know you you've obviously explored it a little bit what the reasons were um yeah but it could all that aside could just because you're a badass you, you know <laughs> yeah, i don't think so <laughs> i think i i got again you look at it you think about it a lot and i think i'd kind of got in this groove of you had to kind of try and be a high achiever um, constantly. Why did you? Why did I don't you know have why that, that was in my psyche. I don't know. Is that from a young age? We were never pushed as kids. You know, mum and dad were amazing. We were really, we were really lucky. But they just they worked really hard. And I think it was that that kind of was ingrained in us. And 
there was just this sense of that you know I had to sort of achieve and it sort of kept going from one thing to another and I'm sure if somebody looked at it there's something there isn't there but yeah so I I did the boards and passed the courses and um, which what was the course? Can you talk about the course? Yeah, the well, the ARV course um, was probably one of the hardest courses that you know that were in the police to, to pass at the time, and um, probably still is. You know, the firearms courses, um, and that was at Lippitz Hill. We did a lot of um, you know learning to use the weapons, and you had to pass you know on the range and all the different tactics and things like that. Um, and I passed that and yeah, went to the the base, which was at Old Street at the time in the centre of London. How and, how long was the selection? Oh, uh, the, the tri- sorry, in fact, how does it work? So you, how do you, do you, you, do you nominate yourself? Say, I want to be, I want to be part of uh, an armed response yeah. unit. Um, and then how do they say yes to you or not? Well, I think I applied, but then it would have been a paper application applied and then went, for an interview and a board where you're throwing these, you know, all these questions and what you what would you do and uh, um, yeah they they um, I think I actually came to top of the selection boards actually um, yeah and then then you had to pass the ARV course. How long was that course? And I knew you were going to ask me that, and I think <laughs> it well, I think it was two weeks, but okay. I forget or even a month. Anyway, but go on. anyway, yeah. Um, and yeah, that that was a pass or fail course. And intense. Yeah, very. Um, ben, my son, had to go and stay with my mum and dad. I think it. Was, I think actually it was a month because he was there for quite a long time while I was on it. And yeah, it was. It was. T- it was tough and something re- completely new to me because I hadn't got a background of firearms or anything. You know, a lot of um, ex-military kind of went on that path. So yeah, a lot to learn. Um, and the third woman on the course. Yeah. It, Ever. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I, I, you know, I, I'm i more proud of it now than I was then. It was kind of just didn't really think about it very much, you know. And I I think I'd always been lucky. I'd worked with some amazing people and I just was always just treated as, you know, Helen. It never, you know, it never came into the equation that you were female, you, you never got treated any differently, which was, you know, it, you know, it was good. It was good. Um, yeah, and then started on on B relief on the ARVs. B relief. So that was like there were, I think there were four different reliefs that covered the whole of London. So a relief would be a group of officers. Can't remember there how many of us there were. Um, that you know, we we came on shift and covered whatever shift it was and rotated. Okay, yeah. like a, to bolster the 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 Met patrols and. Yeah, so we were we were the Met. I guess you'd sort of mobile <laughs> vehicles that responded to any kind of armed incident, whether it be you know knives or guns or whatever. Well, so we could... is it like shift work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what, twelve hour shift. Uh, we we did eight hour shifts at the time so it was six till two two to ten and then night duty was ten till six which was the, which was always the the majority of times a tasty shift was there one that was sort of the one that we more commonly get dramas must be the early hours in the morning shift oh uh, yeah it varied really um it's such a random sort of thing I guess probably the later part of of later and into the early part of nights kind of yeah I suppose but, yeah because it's firearms oriented firearms isn't it? so it's a lot less common and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah 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 so we'd go out in in um vehicles three up and again you, it's a few years ago now so you'd have somebody in the back believe it or not trying to read a map <laughs> <laughs> no GPS. If there was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you turn up at a call and think, God, I feel really sick because I've been trying okay. to read the map in the back of the car. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and you just respond to to whatever came up. Yeah, and that I guess leads on to the next incident, 
which was in 1994 when I was I got I was shot. So um, yeah, it was um, it was Boxing Day 1994, and we just coming to the end of our early turn shift. So it was about two o'clock. We'd gone back to the base. And Had you been home for Christmas? I'd gone home. Yeah, I'd gone home for Christmas Day to mum and dad's and I'd left Ben with them because I had to go back. I couldn't get Boxing Day off. So I'd had to travel back Christmas evening. So I left him, fortunately, with them. And uh, I think the plan was to go back a few days later and pick him up and when I was next off, because they were great, they they helped out wherever they could. And, um, yeah, so it was Boxing Day. We were due to go off. Um, I was supposed to be cooking a meal for my friend. So I'd got all that in my head, you know, what I was going to be doing. We're just literally waiting, waiting to change over. And this call came in to Enfield, North London. At the end of your shift. Yeah, at the end of the shift. To... From the local police who'd, who'd had an incident where this, this guy had uh, turned up, taken his young daughter in the pushchair from the girlfriend, uh, but and she'd seen a gun um, somewhere on him and he'd got a history of violence and firearms offences. So the local police had been called, but they'd called us um, as a firearms unit to, to go out. So we hot-footed it as it were up to uh, to Enfield and um, we arrived at Enfield police station we got briefed by the local police officers you know what was going on and myself and Nick who was more of an experienced <coughs> firearms officer we were tasked with going up to have a look at the flat where they thought he probably was this guy so um, we, we borrowed some um, I borrowed this like this ski jacket off one of the the, the the female police officers at the station, and Nick put a, a jacket on just to sort of, you know, disguise a bit what we looked like. And we went up, we drove up, me and Nick, to look at his flat. So we we went up the stairwell and looked at the door, and just with a, just to have a look at the area with a view that we were going to go back and try and um, you know get get him to come out peacefully. So that was the plan. Which all went kind of wrong. So we did that. I think Nick drew a little sketch plan of the stairwell and, you know, the entrance and all that. Have you ever heard the term no plan survives contact? <laughs> no plan survives. Oh, I haven't heard of that Never one. Heard but... that. No plan survives, you know what contact <laughs> yeah, is, yeah, right? Yeah, so Contact with the enemy and a firefight for layman's terms to civvies listening. Yeah. Not civvies. Well, not civvies, <laughs> but people listening don't understand. No plan survives contact. You write a plan. Everything will go smoothly until the minute the first round is fired. And then it's all, yes. that's it, pear shit. <laughs> Check the plan away. <laughs> that's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. I laugh, but oh, dear. So, yeah, we... So, Nick and I drove back to the, the RV point, which was in a side road, probably a quarter of a mile away from the flat. Oh, a fair distance then. Okay. Yeah. And... Um, Went to the back of the vehicle, where which I'd been in, and, and uh, I was just sort of thinking, oh, I really want to go home. I'm really tired, you know. It's just that those kind of mundane sort of Boxing day thoughts. ordinary yeah. thoughts were 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 in my head, and I I was at the boot of the car thinking, oh, I just I ought to get my body armor on and get you know ready because we're gonna start. You know, forming up and the ambulance arrived because you know you obviously need an ambulance just in case. Just in case, <laughs> yeah. And um, so it went from that thinking about chicken dinner and wanting to go home and how tired I was to literally like it, this surreal situation just exploded. And um, I heard somebody shout, my colleague of mine shout, "That's him!" or "It's him!" something like that. And you're still at the car now, so four hundred meters away from the house. Yeah, so I'm at the back of the car, just thinking about putting my body armor yeah. on and getting kitted up. I've took off this this. Actually, I hadn't took off. I hadn't taken off the ski jacket yet, which is quite quite important. So I've got this brightly coloured ski jacket on, and I hear this. My colleague shout, "It's him!" or something along the lines. Of, and again, this happens so quickly that it's quicker than I can sort of talk really. So, just began 
running towards this guy who I see can see. Was he with the pram? Yeah, with this little push chair in the middle of the junction. He's wearing um, like a sheepskin coat. Um, running towards him, I, I got. What were we? What was he in? To running towards him to do what? Apprehend him? Because I think, because again, I can't really say it quick enough. Because no, as, sure. as, as we're moving going? towards him, raising my gut, my Glock, like this, he shoots. So it's like so quick. So I, I think it's all at the same time. The, the it all must have the shot must have been fired as I was doing that it's I can't quite so your explain colleagues, your colleague your colleague, what, your colleague what, shot, correct me wrong your colleague shouted that's him the guys heard him shouting spotted you guys as you're reacting to your colleague shouting the, the, yeah, so the, he, he did the, this with the gun he put it in his mouth and then extended his hand arm and shot so you've got to kill himself and then change his mind yeah that's what it looked like um but it it's just happening like yeah crazily fast and um yeah so I, I i was running towards him and the shot he let off went through my knee so it was just like being hit with a great big lorry really it was just an impact but no pains but i knew what had happened but i i was sort of by one of the the arv vehicles police cars sort of by the bumper of it and I, I kind of stayed like that and dropped down on my what was now my good knee but and tried, kept my gun up and it was just complete chaos and all Did I, you, re- you realised you'd been shot yeah, you knew, yeah. I knew I'd been yeah. shot yeah by just by the impact mm. but there was no pain I guess that was like the adrenaline because going back just slightly seconds seconds before did the fear that was like going through my body I, my body was like saying run away but of course I, the job you do you run towards but I, I remember that really distinctly that overwhelming sense of fear but you do the opposite you you know you, you that's your training and that's what you do but yeah so there must have been loads of adrenaline pumping around my body which I didn't feel the pain mm. and and all I heard was the one shot and again, it was a bit like with the bombing, a bit of slow motion, kind of, I, I, whether I imagined it or not, but smoke, it was really bizarre. And, and I didn't hear anything else. And he got, I think there were 12 rounds were let off and he was hit by eight. But I kind of didn't hear any of it. It's really, I think it's per- perceptual distortion, isn't it, they call it, I think. But also your mind will be focusing on your on your knee and all the other senses will be shut off. Yeah. It? It's the same, for this, going back to the bombing, similar thing when bomb goes off and everything seems to be really quiet and you only lock on to certain sounds i've experienced the same thing and it's it's not really quiet it is not no yeah, it's not there is yeah all sorts of noise going on from you know the glass shattering on the floor to bits of building falling down to people screaming to people yelling to sirens and yet in your experience in case of the bombing it's um the birds yeah <laughs> all really you was the birds on and the fire alarm yeah yeah so it's the same yeah. thing with, you know you get hit and you're not not hearing 12 shots get getting let off yeah just yeah absolutely that's that's it isn't it it's, i guess it's that survival instinct like you say um yeah and it was a really bizarre situation because there was a bus stop of people behind him you know oh it was God. um he pushed where did, where did the other four rounds go do they know oh uh, what well, <laughs> Don't think they ever found them all. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Thankfully, not in the people in the bus stop. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah it, and my friend Nick, who I'd been with earlier, I didn't see this, but the the push the little push chair that he, the, the guy had got, he pushed the push chair at Nick. So Nick's juggling this toddler and shooting at the same time control of the child and shooting at so the... trying to keep the little toddler safe out of the way <laughs> and yeah so it was just complete chaos but that you know that that happened in like seconds and i must have been aware that it had gone quiet even though i wasn't aware of the noise if that mm. makes sense to you and then i i, I kind of realized it was a bit safe and that i crawled behind the police car at that point and that's when the pain kicked in and then um, I was just on the, on the roadway and we had an ambulance with us and they tended to me, my colleagues tended to me. And how, how debilitating was the pain? 
it was. Although the knee pain's pretty bad. Yeah, it was really, it was really bad. I mean, gunshot, and it, yeah. yeah, and I remember hearing somebody shout, you know, one of ours is down, and it was, it would have been chaos, I guess. Um, and I just lay there looking up, and I, I there was um, the guy who shouted was my friend who I knew from Hornsey, and uh, he came over, and I kind of looked up at him and said, "Oh, not again, Richard." You know, it's like, oh, God. <laughs> and yeah, they cut off my trousers and put a drip in. And what was the significance and, of the ski jacket? You said at the start. Oh yeah, you said, I you said the that. ski jacket is important for some reason. Yeah, well. When the sus- yeah, I forgot that bit. When um, when the sus- suspect was interviewed, he kind of had recognised me from earlier because he'd been watching us in his flat. Go go and look at his flat. Oh, you did a recce. Yeah, we did a recce. The overt recce. Yeah, we're wearing the ski jacket. He'd seen us, and when he he's he kind of recognised the ski jacket in the side street where we were. Right. Yeah. Right, so right, it was kind right, of right, right. significant. I was a bit of a. Bit of a target, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I went off to hospital in the in the land ambulance. He went off in the helicopter. He, he was the, more the, seriously yeah, yeah. the medic. Yeah, the um, criminal. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Jumping around a bit there. He went off in the helicopter because he was more seriously injured, and I went by road to the local hospital and got treated there. Um, again, spent a couple of nights in hospital, um, but it, it was a local hospital and they didn't really have experience of gunshot wounds, so they stitched the entry and the exit up and it, a few weeks later it all got infected and I, I ended up going to the military hospital at Woolwich, which was, was then, mm-hmm. and they, they were amazing and they they treated it, irrigate, you know, cleaned it all out and left it all open and... And then it then it healed really well. And again, I was incredibly lucky because it went in the front, round the side, and out the back. And I missed the bones. Incredibly lucky. And yeah. the specialist said, you know, it was like a millimeter away from just shattering my kneecap. Jesus. So just so, you know, incredibly lucky. Very lucky. Well, I don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> how did how did um, how did the medical discharge come about? Because we've the reason I ask, the reason I ask, and and is you you've mentioned a couple of times, and as, and as I know from previous chats here, that the the you know stress wasn't talked about back then. Yeah. Um, especially for the PTSD thing wasn't you know it wasn't wasn't talked about back then. It wasn't really understood back then. No. So it interests me how 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 that medical discharge came about. You know, if you don't mind talking about what yeah what what led to it. That's. Great question because um, it wasn't something that was talk- known about. You know, was wasn't on the radar really. Um, what happened was, so I, I was off sick, and um, I remember going to the chief medical officer. Who, it's off sick because of the knee. Off sick because of the knee. Yeah. And I remember going to the chief medical officer um, at, for an appointment, and he said to me jokingly and laughing oh you've been lucky when we so when we're going to get you back to work and that was the kind of first time I kind of and I sat there with a good friend of mine Colin who was my federation rep he's become a great friend and he was amazing that, federation rep. yeah so he was like we didn't have a union he was the equivalent of what our union representative police so, federation yeah in the firearms department he was he was amazing and he was ahead of his time <laughs> with his understanding of mental health and welfare, and he was just a, well, he still is an amazing guy. Um, he was sat next to me, and I, it, that was the first time I, and I, this this chief medical officer's like j- joking about it and laughing, and I thought, oh my God, you know, going back to work, it was like this feeling of dread. Um, so kind of, that's probably started thinking something up, but not understanding it, and, um, I was really lucky. One of the other girls who had been stabbed had been... um, She'd been sent to see a guy called Professor Gordon Turnbull, who's like a leading expert in trauma. He'd started off in the RAF, and he'd he'd done some... really been involved in Lockerbie debriefing, like the search team. Really, like, top of... of, 
his knowledge of trauma and post-traumatic stress. So there followed this long process, which was difficult at the time, and I was thankful I'd got Colin, because he was kind of my voice when I was very, very vulnerable, and, you know, um, at my at a very low point. Uh, he was my voice, and... I, you know, um, Jenny, who'd been to, been to see Professor Turnbull, they kind of fought on my behalf to get the funding to go and see him, and I was I was lucky to get that funding. And uh, eventually, after what seemed like an endless battle at the time of months, I got referred to him in in the following end of the following year, and I went on like a two week sort of residential. Um, program around PTSD um, and it just brought together four of us that they, they were different backgrounds of people they'd had different traumas but brought us together on this two-week intensive course and you know realized by talking through and different things they did with us that you know you're not crazy it's just a normal reaction to a very abnormal event or set of events you know life-threatening trauma um, and we'd all got very similar, you know, um, sort of mental health, I call it mental health issues, around that are different traumas. And that, that was... Similar a, symptoms. Symptoms, that's the word, yeah. That well, was a... Can you explain some of them for me? Is that right? Yeah, sure. And again, they're, they're probably manifest differently in different people, but they're, they're, there's a common, there is a common... They'll also be very common. ...common yeah. theme as well. Um, and I think for me... It was um, sort of reliving the incidents, but, um, being c kind of very, quite angry because um, I probably didn't understand what was going on. You know, I didn't realise that I was trauma traumatised, and you know, not un um, and for for me, it was very much uh, I I coped by training, and that's been a theme, physical training. Physical training. And that's kind of been a theme really sort of throughout of coping. So I, I'd have to, have to, you know, run or go to the gym, you know, obviously to get rid of, you know, the, the adrenaline and the cortisol, all those sort of chemicals that, you know, cause you, your body to be stressed and to feel better. And also to kind of occupy my mind, you know. Um, I, I, I think I, I, I thought about this earlier. I think I did through frustration think about ending my life but never planned anything and I, because um i'd got ben and he was four and i was his mum and for me that kind of saved me in a way because I, I had to I, I i couldn't give up i couldn't give up on him and um so he he was a very very positive influence on keeping me um, sort of trying to get better, you know, on that track. Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot of frustration, and you know, trying to get f funding felt. It, it, it what do you mean trying to get funding? Funding to get on this 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 um, program with Gordon Turnbull seemed like a battle. That you know, I it was a job that I'd I'd loved, but it kind of didn't love you back. That was a harsh reality. Ah, so you'd wanted to get on to, onto the Gordon Turnbull yeah. course, and so and you'd gone to the police for the funding. Yeah, well, my friends had and Colin had. Funny. They were fighting on my behalf, you know, because um, you kind of need that voice when you're so low and vulnerable. Um, but it did come, and I was lucky. I was lucky, mm. um, and I am really thankful. For that but at the time it was kind of a, a period of months probably over seven months of no treatment you know I had to function as a mum you know and as a, as a human being with all these kind of random things that, that, that we don't understand this you think you're with, going mad this is the thing with responsibility and we, we spoke of this when we first met the other week uh, um, we spoke about sort of touching this the other week in that with my <clears throat> thoughts on that, that, that when you have uh, when you have a responsibility, when you have that mental, um, I fucking hate saying mental illness at the minute. Uh, when you have that uh, mental in injury, 
right? Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I like that. Injuries, like injuries sound short term, doesn't it? It's a cheat you can get yeah, over. Yeah. Illness sounds like chronic, yeah. right? So you have that sort of mental injury, or you're, you're operating at less than a hundred percent, which is you are right. You know, you're a bit further down that that spectrum than you, you'd like to be. That that scale that you'd like to be. Um, one of the things that definitely keeps people going for longer than they would maybe be able to cope with otherwise is responsibility mm. what's the biggest responsibility in the world you know it's, it's raising raising a child yeah. right? it's mothering a child and um, and uh, but that doesn't mean it is a positive impact in reality it, I think you know in reality unless you in reality just sort of masks it, it dumbs down the symptoms of that are that are, in, that are impacting you know, they're making your life you know really hard to get through it dumbs them down um, and unless you understand, unless you have a, a better than average, a better than normal understanding of you know the way the brain works, the way trauma affects the mind, the way and the tools that are there to be able to um, improve yourself, not not fix, improve yourself, mm. you know, step yourself up a level. Unless you understand those tools and what's there to be able to help you, or be able to help you help yourself, you know, in your case, physical fitness, you mm. know, physical training, then unless you know that it. it can be a hideous. I mean, best case scenario, and that if you don't have the tools, to understand you got responsibility there, which keeps you going. I got you know, keeps you going. I got to do this, got to do this, whatever that may be. You know, children, an example. You don't understand the tools. You don't understand what's going on in your mind. The best case scenario, and that is, you live out your life, your dying days, having not enjoyed one second of it, not yeah. one second of it. It's just been, a, you've just, you've just been coping the whole time. Yeah, just trying to get through it the whole time, which is not the way to live. Which is not the way to live. You know. Um, and I, I think, and that you can see that jumping on, you know, to, to now. T- t- thankfully, there's so much more awareness, but there's so many people that are struggling, you know, and still, although it's, a, you know, come such a long way, and and um, you know, there's a massive improvement in, you know, we talk about it. There's all the social media, you know, there's groups connecting people. There's, you know, there is f- some funding coming, you know, available, but. And it has come a long way, but there's still so much more that you know we could do to help people. And yeah. I do think I do think that we're, especially for the last four or five years, I think in general, uh, I think from a military perspective, as in military veterans, but also that 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 impacts the wider community and and this and the services. Right, I think we are, especially for the last five six years, leaps and bounds ahead of what we were in terms of the general understanding of your average man or woman who served in whatever service right the general understanding that they have of mental health that that that, that general understanding and 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 that and i think that's that's a lot to do with as you said there the networks the groups the social media um just the the conversation is becoming more acceptable Mm -hmm. to have which means people are more exposed to those conversations and so learn a bit more from physical training to meditation to you know and those are the things you can do yourself you know to um to uh just generally be more active in mind like physical training and then to the the um external sort of influence you can have on yourself counseling and and, and things like that right and kind of, yeah you know i think we are a lot better off than we were five six mm. years ago because that conversation has been a lot more accepted which means i think that the impact of um, of uh, traumatic experiences on on people is a lot uh, less impactful than it was before. However, completely on board. You're saying there's still a lot to be done with um, with getting sort of formal support and the organisations in place to do it. But you've just come back from yeah, Hidden Valley absolutely. Bushcraft. Nick Nick Nick, Nick Goldsmith was our second ever podcast. Oh, what a dude. Yeah. And again, that was a yeah, in fact, explain it. Explain, explain. Yeah. That weekend. So all these years later, um, you know, I, I'm just jumping back slightly. You know, I did develop some, you know, bulimia at one point. So you know, oh, really? I, yeah, that was kind of a control thing. Um, so that 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 was another way. That explain it, that. Explain. Yeah. So sorry, I've just sort of gone, Go gone on. back. But I didn't a bit. know. So, but yeah. I, I I fired you forward yeah, by like yeah. ten years. Um, I think it was at a time where everything was out of control in my life, you know, it's just gone, because I always thought I was this robust, strong character, you know, get stuck into anything. And um, 
so my life was pretty chaotic you know um my marriage was falling apart um and so everything was chaotic you know all these traumatic things had happened and i think again looking back it was that i'd eat and then you know hate myself because i'd eaten so much and then you know, want to have to be sick so there was this cycle of what you that you know is bulimia it didn't go on for a horrendous long period of time and i kind of somehow and i don't quite know how i got a grip of it and um it did you know it did i was lucky and it did go away um so sorry i jumped back you know because so there's loads of ways people can be affected that like, and that that was kind of a random thing that I just didn't understand at all. And those symptoms, like you said, though those symptoms, they, everyone experiences things differently. There are common things like the other people who experienced bulimia, other people who experienced that frustration, you know, um, anger, which is really common. But the the fixes and the things that you can do to improve that, those the, sort of the tools you can use to improve your situation. They are pretty fucking common across the board. Mm. You know, they're pretty yeah. pretty common across the board. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, coming back to to um, Hidden Valley Bushcraft and Wooden Warrior Program, Nick Goldsmith and Louise. I mean, incredible. That came about by um, in May of this year. I got asked to be part of a team of veterans um, breaking the hour and twenty four hour deadlifting world record. This was for Rock to Recovery. That's for Rock to Recovery. Right, yeah. Um, I got a phone call late at night. <laughs> we need somebody, an extra person in the 12 team, you know, a member team. Would you do it? Um, okay, then. Put the phone down, as it were. I thought, oh, my God, what have I just said yes to? And spent the next six months having a panic attack, thinking, oh, I'm too old, I'm too this, I'm too that, you know, the, all these negative thoughts <laughs> trained as hard as I could deadlifting anyway. for 24 hours right? 24 hours of deadlifting <laughs> in a gym in East Grinstead yeah and actually when I after I said yes I thought I, I do train quite hard with weights but I'm not entirely sure what a deadlift is yeah. <laughs> so I had, kind of had to research that one and anyway so we did it in May and we went down and um we broke the hour and 24 hour deadlifting world record. And I was so anxious. God, my anxiety was just... Before? During? When? Um, leading up to it, the months leading up to it, but it got increasingly worse as, as it approached because I thought I, I'm going to let everybody down, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm old, probably 15 years older than the next oldest person. And all these, these this chatter, you know, that voice we all have. Yeah. But fortunately, my eldest son was doing it and my youngest son was coming down to support us. So they kind of gave me a bit of, you know, a courage that I need, needed. Anyway, I couldn't say no and I, I trained hard and we, we did it. Um, and that was, it was really interesting. That that was kind of a, it was a really fantastic thing to do. We raised money for Rock to Recovery, which is what I wanted to do. That's why I'd said yes. That's Fox's that's, charity. That's Fox's it? charity to raise money, you know, to help. As in Jason Fox. Yep. Yeah. Right. Jason Fox. And they were amazing. He he turned up when we'd just broken the hour world record with Dan Elliott and Al, the old soldiers, you know, who... who, who um, and they were great. And Dan Elliott um, would, had been talking to, to Jack, who's 19, my youngest son, who was doing some of the counting and helping behind the scenes. And he'd obviously sort of told him a bit about me, his mum. Um, so we did the hour, broke the hour world record, had a quick chat to Foxy and I'd got his book and I asked him to sign it and we had a bit of a chat. And then I spoke to Dan and he, he just said, he was just really nice and I said I'd been so anxious and he, he said, I can't even remember what he said. Who's Dan? Dan Elliott, but he was so kind and he kind of just... And he, he said, oh, we can help you too. And it's just some really, I can't even remember what he said, but he was lovely. And we had photos with, with them all. And it was just a moment that kind of opened something in my head. But I'm not quite sure what happened. So I went away from there. And um, to be quite honest, for about a week, I was quite ill after. I mean, it just 
it really knocked knocked the stuffing out physically. of me physically. Yeah. And I think it took me about three weeks to recover. Um, and that was kind of a bit of a surprise because I've got this kind of ability to push myself and I've always been able to do that. But it was kind of, I thought, can't keep doing this extreme sort of training and it, it just changed something in me. And um, anyway, I ended up going to see Jamie um, at Rock to Recovery up in London around the anxiety. Um, and he, he helped me. He, he, was, he, he was tremendously helpful. And well, Jamie, Jamie's one of the founders as well, isn't he? Of, he is, yeah. of Rock to Recovery. Sorry, I, I feel like I did a disservice to the, at the Rock to Recovery people. It's not Foxy's charity. Foxy's one of the people who set it up with... And with all these amazing yeah, yeah. people. You know, they are doing a, a, a fantastic job. And he, he, he helped me um, enormously. And I've spoken to Dan uh, um, on occasions, and he's really helped me. Um, but that that led me on um, to seeing Hidden Valley Bushcraft, who's kind of he connected on Instagram with Rock to Recovery. So I started following them and thought, wow, that's amazing. So this project where Nick has bought this bit of woodland, woodland and you know they, it's been a hard road for them, but he'd had this incredible vision and uh, amazing. And they set up a, a kindergarten and then they've it's evolved and now they're helping veterans and emergency services. So I sat there, I saw this email, this message that had come out saying, you know, if you'd like to come on a Woodland Warrior weekend for veterans and emergency services who are struggling. And I thought, no, you, you can't. There's people way worse than you, Helen. You can't contact them. And I went on like this in my front room for weeks. And I don't know why, but something kind of gave me, I call it the courage, to contact them and, and tell them a bit about my story and could I could I come thinking they'd say no you're you know you're not worthy and <laughs> and of course they they and we went and volunteered down there as a family helping build put help develop it to put those paths down with wood chips so we did that a few weeks before and anyway I went on the Woodland Warrior program so it, it's a weekend in the woods where you camp overnight and um with with a few of you who've military veterans it could be um from different backgrounds and you sit around the fire you do wood crafting you do learn some bushcraft you you make your own shelter um and it just slows your mind down and he's just it's just amazing what him and, and louise do nick and louise do and um you just chat if you want to or you're quiet you know and it's 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 that sort of connecting you could just look into people's eyes and although their although their trauma is entirely different to yours you kind of know they get you and you get them and you you don't even have to explain it's it's and it's that connecting and a sense of belonging that i think that, which is i think you lose i i felt it was before when I went through medical ill health. There was no no Instagram, no Facebook, no mobile phones. It was a, it was a fairly new concept. Gone, you were gone. You were just isolated. So, you know, this is just such an amazing project, and it really works. And um, you know, through going there, um, Nick sort of said, "You've got this amazing story to tell, Helen. You you must tell it." And he kind of just gave me this sort of a bit of belief that um you know he said it's so current you, you need to tell it and so he, he he put me in touch with you and that's why I'm sat here now so if I hadn't have done the deadlifting to help rock to recovery you know right you know and and because it would have been easy to have said no um it's, it's it's kind of snowballed from that really and he, he, you know it's amazing just a few words from nick and the other people that were there have said you know you've got this story that's really worth getting out there it's it's current now although it's happened a long time ago you know it's um so i just you know love to somehow be able to through what i've gone through i kind of think it it's all it's a curse but it's a gift as well 
uh, I'd love to, you know, maybe get them more funding. They've got p funding for yeah, from Harry, before. Prince Harry, for veterans. But it would be be great to get funding for the emergency services so they could have them there as well. You know, it's fund so that, yeah. So Prince Harry is uh, through his uh, what's his, his Endeavour 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 Fund is they've they're providing funding to is this to Hidden Valley Bushcraft so that they can pay for uh, veterans to come to there. Yeah, I think it's about yeah. 78 next year, you know, oh, okay. that they, they've got right. funding for. And so you, you, you have to get in similar funding for that Hidden Valley Bushcraft for, for Blue Light Services. For the emergency services, services yeah. as well, you know. And, yeah. and how it, it's just, it works, you know, it, it's... Um, it does. It just slows everything down, makes everything simple. You're just out in nature and you know, looking around the fire, and you know, just simple, basic things. Um, in this, what is a complex world, isn't it? You know, with this. My my favorite thing is being out outdoors. I I I go. I take the kids camping. We go not not campsite camping. We go in the middle of nowhere camping. You know, and um, no phone signal, nothing. Fire tents and it's just well ponchos normally but it's just uh is some there's just something about it there's, yeah. so there's something about it you know and that and that's me on my own obviously with my kids and then you take that up on that level like you're saying you you're with like-minded people either people are suffering through trauma yeah or like-minded can be you're from the same type of background yeah. could be all services you know from coppers to fire service to military there you there's a there's a similar theme to all those services you know it's it's, it's sacrifice right Absolutely. sin eaters guild are you a sin eaters guild so sin eaters guild is a it's a it's a clothes online looks like a clothing and apparel company right and the guy you set it up is ex-military ex one power got the podcast actually really good guy guess uh guess walsh gaz walsh gaz walsh and but Sinita's Guild, in, in reality, is what it is. It's, it's, it's about a, a community, demonstrating a community. And it, I can't remember the exact quote. It's it's a community around... So what's a Sinita? What's a Sinita's Guild? It's a community of people who are willing to sacrifice themselves, yeah. you know, their health for the for the, um, health, the health of others, for, yeah. the, for, the, the, yeah, the, for saving other people, basically. Police, fire service, ambulance service military is exactly what it is and mm. and, and that's and, and that those communities you know i i could go and sit in a you could go and sit down now with a bunch of coppers that you never ever met but you knew the police helen or you knew they were fire service you knew the military you can go and sit there now and i'm guessing after your experience in my bushcraft you go and sit there and you'd feel immediately more comfortable than you would if you were if you're in a room full of you every single one of them were just bog standard no, no military background oh no services background am i right completely that's Exactly, yeah. And without you having to speak about anything, yeah. you get something cathartic from it. Yeah. You know? It's kind of, it's almost like an energy that, that that's given out by everybody that you just know that it is that sense of belonging. You know you're in a, in a safe environment. You're not going to be judged. Um, you know, you, you learn new skills. Nick's so knowledgeable. Um, and it's all stuff, you know, like... We were making these feather sticks to light the fire, and it just takes you out of your thinking brain and calms your mind, you know, like yoga or whatever it is, you know, all those sort of things, gardening, whatever people find that's running. Running, yeah. And it did all that. And I had the most amazing night's sleep under this tar bit of tarpaulin in, just in, in the trees. In fact, yeah. they had to come and wake me up. <laughs> <laughs> I got woken up with yeah. a cup of tea. Silence, but, yeah. silence, nothing. Looking at the stars, you cannot, yeah. cannot beat it. Yeah, completely switching yourself off from the world, you know. And you're, are you, are you alone with your thoughts, or you're alone with other people's thoughts and company, you know. And you're away from family, you know. Any family things that are going on, you know. It's literally time, time for you to break. And um, he's so knowledgeable. You learn things, you know, about different mushrooms and trees and plants, and you know you. You use some of them to make teas, and we, yeah, uh, it, it, it's just it is fantastic, and I'd love so more people to be, you know, exposed to that, and that be, you know, have the be the funding that they could mm -hmm. help more people, and if somehow by telling my story, you know, it um, 
could help them get that funding. It would just make me so happy. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure people listening are watching. I'm sure people are listening or watching and thinking, oh, no, they'll get in touch. I often get people get in touch with the podcast, want to reach out to the guests, and I'm sure that will help this time. I hope it does. I hope it does. And if I can help in any other way, that would be amazing. Um, because you you are an inspirational individual. You know, you've got an amazing story. Um, you know, it's an unfortunately impacted you know, in, in not the greatest of ways, but you've you found a way through it. And you, look, you know, look who you are now. You know, it's um, you are an inspirational individual. You are. Um, we're going to have to start wrapping it up. We've mentioned Hidden Valley Bushcraft. Yep. Uh, is there anything else you want to get across or that we haven't mentioned or, or whatever? Shameless plug opportunity now, basically. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, it's just, it, it, was, it was just the people at Rock to Co- Recovery helped Rock me Recovery, and yeah. that led on to hit to, you know, Nick Goldsmith and Louise Goldsmith and they've worked so hard. It'd just be awesome if to get them more funding to help more people because, yeah. you know, give, you know, show, because it's, it doesn't have to be all bad that comes from these bad, awful incidents. You know, good can come from it. Good, good in terms of real world, and good, good in terms in your, of your physi- mentally. Yeah, yeah, and and you yeah exactly. Michael yeah, Close, wrote. Michael Close declassified. I first heard it from him. Post traumatic growth. You know, there are positives to be gained. Definitely. From it, you know. Um, Definitely. So yeah, Helen, it's been an absolute pleasure, and you. you'll be coming back on again after we sort out the project. Project. Thanks, Hugh. Project. Thanks a lot. Cool. Thanks, Hugh. Lloyd.